he could not answer. Should these results, the, the, there was a study that he was referring to about the quality of life in, in children with spina bifida, should these results be used in determining treatments at birth or pre-birth? Should parents of infants with higher lesions be encouraged not to have their children treated? If non-treatment were encouraged, what should be done to mitigate suffering of the child and family? Most families of newborns with spina bifida have little or no concept of what the child's future holds. What is the physician's role in educating them? What role should the physician play in influencing their decisions regarding treatment? What can or should be done to mitigate the suffering of the child, the parent, and the medical staff if non-treatment is selected? So these are some of the questions that we still ponder today with other neurologic disorders, and that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy and lead our panel. Thank you, Mark, and let me just add my welcome and also um, my great appreciation for John's leadership um, in helping us to really think about some of these fundamental questions that at the beginning of his career are still largely unanswered. And it's in that space of uncertainty and ambiguity that most of us spend a good bit of our time, and it's no more acute than in the context of um, how do we make decisions for children who have devastating neurologic injuries. So we've um, brought together a panel today of, um, I think, some di diverse perspectives on this very important question. And before we start, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And then um, we will uh, ask Dr. Sharp to uh, begin the conversation with a case that is a case that is actually a composite case that represents many of the issues that we struggle with in the context of children with neurological uh, devastation. So, let's start. Uh, my name is April Sharp. I'm a pediatric neurology chief resident um, and a member of the ethics committee. I'm Matt Norvell, the chaplain for the Children's Center and uh, also a member of the ethics committee. I'm Becky Riggs. I'm a pediatric neurointensivist and associate with medical unit director of pediatric neurocorporate care here at John Hopkins. I'm a former life. I was a pediatric social worker and neurological watcher. I'm Emily Johnson. I'm a nurse practitioner um, with the palliative care team and I'm embedded in would you like to begin? Great. Um, so our, our representative case today is JS. Uh, JS is a, a five-year-old previously healthy, developmentally normal girl who was unfortunately found at the bottom of a family swimming pool during a Labor Day barbecue. She had last been seen by her parents about 15 minutes prior to being found. She was When she was pulled out of the pool, she was not breathing. She had no pulse. So bystander CPR was initiated immediately, and EMS arrived about 10 minutes later. They were able to obtain return of spontaneous circulation after about 15 minutes. So her total downtime was estimated to be anywhere from 25 to 40 minutes. She was then transported to the PICU, where she had a glass call coma score, or GCS, of, of 3 on arrival. Her pupils were fixed and dilated initially. She displayed no spontaneous movements. Um, a head CT was obtained uh, very early on, showed early signs of brain edema. Over the first 24 hours after the injury, she was stabilized from a cardiorespiratory standpoint. And then on hospital day two, she started taking infrequent, shallow, and irregular breaths over the ventilator. She was monitored for an additional 48 hours without any improvement of her neurological exam, because it's to about four days after injury. Irregular breaths remain the only evidence of brainstem function. A brain MRI was done and showed a severe irreversible hypoxic injury and evidence of brainstem herniation. The PICU and neurology teams following her both agreed that her injury was irreversible and that significant recovery was very unlikely. They agreed that she did not meet criteria for brain death due to the irregular breaths. Um, and thus, uh, for this child, the idea of survival would entail requiring a, a tracheostomy for a continued mechanical and ventilation and a G tube for artificial nutrition, nutrition to support her body in a permanently comfortable state. 
So these are the kinds of cases that, um, in particular, our um, colleagues in critical care often confront. So I'm going to uh, ask our panel, starting with Emily, to just reflect on this case and what are the insights that you have uh, in working with these kinds of cases and situations? Thanks. Um, so, A, they're always emotional and they're really hard. Um, we'll start there. Um, it's a case where there's really not a good outcome that we can achieve. We're either looking at an end of life experience um, or a um, situation that probably um, the parents have never thought about. Um, and also really, they really can't achieve any goals of their hopes for um, what they were um, expecting their child's development um, to be. Um, and I would say that from a family standpoint is that as much as we try to help make things be informed decisions, what we're really looking for and sitting with our parents in a lot of emotion and grief and helping them navigate which emotions are actually impacting their decision making. And it's really hard to find a decision that achieves a goal because most families don't want their child to die, but at the same time living in a state um, that's permanently connected to machines and comatose, they don't want either. So we're just kind of stuck um, in a space with um, goals that are hard to achieve. Yeah, um, completely agree with Emily and Emily said. Unfortunately, this is a very border uh, situation that, that we face um, all too often in the PICU. Um, and it's always horribly tragic. And how well we as a PICU team and from a multidisciplinary approach you know, handle these families and these situations, the outcomes can be astronomically different. Um, and, I think it is truly very important to approach it from a multidisciplinary setting and where the entire team completes on the same page with the same goals and mind supporting the family and helping to integrate the family's belief system into the decision making process. Um, but at the same time, as a pediatric neurointensivist, I have certainty that child's going to live in a hotel state. It's also our priority is the child living in that state, the child that's in that bed. Well, my personal approach would be to prioritize the sending meditation to resuscitation and truly working towards end of life care in a manner that we could provide the child with lying that bed, truly a dignified death in this process. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about, yeah, this is a five year old girl on a Labor Day barbecue. She may they may have been planning for her to start kindergarten the next day, right? Like, when I end up working with families in this setting, um, it's really a, a lot, of, similar to what Emily said, it's, it's a lot of helping them uh, start to conceptualize what they're looking at. Because they've never, ever dreamed of a moment like this. They've never, ever dreamed of their daughter being in the intensive care. They've never, ever dreamed that for some reason, she would not go to kindergarten the next day. And now they're being given this news that is really shocking. They're overwhelmed with grief. They're overwhelmed with information because maybe they maybe they had a little bit of a medical, medical IQ before, but maybe they just had never had a sick family member. And so they're being taught how the hospital works, and they're being taught how the brain works, and they're being taught how bodies work really fast in the context of trying to understand what it's going to mean for their, for their daughter and their family. And so I work to kind of come alongside the family as best I can to understand, because we have to work really hard and really fast too, trying to understand a little bit about who they are and where they come from and how they make decisions and who are the primary decision makers in the room. And do the, if there are two parents present, do they equally make decisions together? If the parents aren't together, who's, who do we talk to first? Who, who do we follow up with? Is there a grandparent that's maybe the one that's kind of helping to make choices? Uh, we, we end up doing a lot of like social investigation in those, especially in those first few moments and first few days, and trying to understand who these people are so that we can work with them to help them make the best decision on behalf of the dog, which is uh, a really, really hard thing to do. Great. I'm also going to echo what Emily said. 
sentiment of how emotional these cases are and how important it is um, for us as, as the multidisciplinary team to recognize that emotion. I think there are times when we can get very caught up in the physiology of the brain working and, and the heart working and the lungs working and uh, focus on that instead of sort of more focusing on the ele elephant in the room, which is that this is such a devastating case for, for anyone, um, but especially for anyone who takes care of children or has children of their own. Um, and, I, and I think setting that sort of expectation within um, ourselves uh, helps us be where the family is when we come to them with the inevitably difficult um, and devastating news uh, that we don't expect to be recovering. Um, as as a neurologist, I'm often charged with uh, having uh, that conversation after we get the imaging or after we've done the exam that doesn't show um, much of any brain function. Um, and, and in that role, I, I try to um, meet the family where they are and, and build off of that. So very quickly, you get a sense of what the family is hoping for. and, and what the family has heard so far, um, and, and starting there and not overloading with them with information I feel is very important, but I also think it's important to be upfront and, and straightforward in a very gentle manner. Um, that Those initial conversations, uh, there's often one big conversation where we uh, give all of the news, give our expectations, um, after that conversation, I think, depending on how that goes, really sets the stage for all the decision making that comes afterwards. And it can go really well uh, if it's planned well, and and we do it in a partnership with the family. And and it can go poorly if we don't focus on all of the other things that are going on. So. Uh I'm sure everybody in this room appreciates the intense emotion that, that surrounds these cases. And yet, we're often in a very time-compressed decision-making process where decisions need to be made um, fairly quickly. Um, and I think a lot of times we're struggling with where are the ethical boundaries in terms of what kinds of therapies ought to be even offered in these circumstances. So I'm wondering, um, Dr. Riggs in particular, how do you think about those boundaries in these, in these circumstances? Yeah, I, I do believe that timing is everything, and no family is able to hear this all at once. You know, it is a series of conversations over time periods now. Is it that a family needs eight hours, do they need 24 hours, do they need 48, 72? You know, it's hard to say, and you work to a degree on their time scale. You know, if we're asking for three weeks or even a week, you know, sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this truly a time frame that this family needs and is this the right thing for the patient in the bed? But the last thing you want to do is rush a family in the situation or push them too hard. Now granted it's our job to push them because we're being honest about the situation that we are in. We absolutely need to work on their time frame. The only way that you get to know what that is exactly what we've all said. So you have to get to know the family. You have to get to know them really quickly. And a lot of people need to get to know the family where they're at. And um, as a pediatric uh, neurointensivist, uh, you know, when it comes to other therapies, we don't have a therapy for irreversible brain damage. It's going to be a permanent comatose state. And I think April said that very well, that we can get distracted about the lungs and about the kidneys, the different things that we can do to keep the heart beating. We don't have any therapies that can fix that broken brain, that can bring that child back to a meaningful state of life. And I think that that needs to be the focus of all the conversations with the family and with other caretakers. Because many people would jump in and say, Oh, but if you put a tracheostomy in a gene tube and you put them on a whole lot of medicines to keep them from seizing all the time, then you could keep that body alive. And you could keep that body alive for a really long time. Is that really the right thing to do? 
we have a child who's so neurologically devastated. So I, and I think that that's a big challenge that we often run into is how do we um, how do we balance the awareness? And I appreciate what you said earlier about your priority is the child that's in the bed, and how do we balance that with the family's wishes, who maybe culturally, maybe religiously, maybe just because of who they are, are gonna say if you can keep this child's heart going and you can put them on a all the equipment needed for long-term care, we're going to take it. And that's a real, I mean, I know that for a lot of folks that work in intensive care, of any flavor, right, That that's a, a really hard question. You go, oh my gosh, what are we obligating this human to? What are we obligating their supporters to? What are we obligating society to? And at the same time, like, legally, is Jeff here? <laughs> you, the attorney's not here. Legally <laughs> and ethically like a person can make that choice to commit themselves, their family member, the, and society to do that. We, you know, I have the gut instinct that I want to honor that if that's the choice that they want to make. I think that is another layer to the real conflict of um, how are we setting up this, this whole situation and then medical management sometimes leads and sometimes follows that, right, based on their decision. And then also it gets particularly tricky because our typical frameworks, when we think about these things, ethical frameworks and how to balance this, we often think of like what the is the child or what's the harm. These are the things that we do every day, and usually there is some sort of way to go. But if you actually like, get down to the textbook nitty gritty of it, between vegetative states and permanently comatose, um, because of their state of awareness and their, their lack of um, brain function, it's really hard to argue that they're suffering because there really and truly is not a level of consciousness. Um, there's an existential process that we can project upon them, but really and truly within their own body, it, it can be argued on both sides. So at the same time, you can argue that a trait in a ventilator wouldn't benefit this child, and then they could also argue that it also wouldn't harm them necessarily. So really and truly, there's arguments for both sides in these states, which kind of takes us a little out of the norm from what we would have in other situations. I think that's a really important distinction that, you know, in our minds, technology equals suffering. <clears throat> and as, as Emily's pointing out, you know, does that argument actually apply in these circumstances? So if suffering is not the, you know, sort of uh, currency that we're going to balance, what other interests are there? And how do parents' interests and their perspective factor into that, as well as the larger societal context of how we use resources? One of the one of the big challenges for parents is, and this was touched upon before, is that uh, making that decision to say it's okay to let my child die is is probably the hardest decision that a parent could ever make. Um, and and the, our system of healthcare gives them that decision. That is their decision to make. But I think it. Um, there are families who are not able to say those words and are not able to say that that's okay, even if in their minds or in their understanding they, they know that their child is um, only staying alive through therapies and they wouldn't necessarily want their child to only be alive because of machines. Um, so there are ways in conversation to, uh, I don't want to say normalize, but to, to make it parents understand that it's okay to make that decision for their child, that there are circumstances that it's, it's okay to say, I'm going to allow these technologies to be taken away and let my child pass away. <coughs> one of the ways that I do that when I'm having this conversation is to say, in this situation, which no one ever thinks they're going to be in, some families will decide that they don't want this or they don't want that. And I think just that um, those sentiments that they are not the only ones who have had to make this decision and that other families have done it and it's been okay has been helpful in my experience. Just as a follow-up, either for anybody else, how do you know 
and I guess sometimes medically there's a it's a vision of I can draw this line. I'm not going to offer this intervention. But uh, are there are there other spots where you can say like we're not going to offer this because we don't want the family to we don't want to burden the family with this choice? <clears throat> Again, in my personal practice, I focus on the child in the bed. However, in pediatrics, we say that all the time, and you would have to consider the family dynamics. How many situations can we totally ignore family dynamics when we can? But and I think that uh, it is a consideration. What if there's four other children in the home? And if we trach and G2, when we have a neurologically devastated child living at home, what attention and care are those for the children going to receive? How many marriages are going to be able to survive this? You know, what are the massive amount of manpower and technological resources that this family, this marriage, these siblings are going to have to pour into this comatose child just simply to keep them alive? A massive amount of readmissions in and out of the ICU, in and out of the hospital, just simply to keep the child alive. Um, you know, it's a burden that, that is hard to ignore. Uh, the financial burdens, the, the physical, the psychological burdens. I think it's hard to not recognize that. And I think um, piggybacking on what April said earlier too, when having these end of life decisions, it's always important to meet the family halfway and meet them where they're at. So personally, when I'm to the point where it's time, you know, when I approach the family, I say, it's time to let Johnny go, it's time to let Sally go. And that's how I frame it. And very few times have I ever framed it like that. But when the time is right, and we've done a really good job from a multidisciplinary standpoint, most families saw them and they nod. They know what it's like. One of the challenges uh, in pediatrics in particular is the issue of uncertainty. And um, when we confront a case like this, on the one hand, um, there's a certain level of certainty in terms of the, our ability to diagnose the child's uh, current situation and predict reasonably the prognosis. But we also know that children are are quite resilient, and um, I think that that often plays into parents' uh, inclination that um, perhaps my child will not be, not follow this path, or question your diagnosis of, of their situation and their prognosis. How do you work with that? There are uh, good studies in the literature about sort of what we've been talking about of being the family where they are, of validating their, their sense of hope, and, and not taking away the hope um, that they have for their child, which they're always going to have for their child, but uh, sort of moving into the, the realm of, uh, even though we all hope for the best, this is what we, we know because of how the brain works and because of the many cases that we have seen. Um, and I think that's where it's important to, to paint that picture of what things will look like in a year or five years or 10 years. Um, not with gruesome detail because that's, that's unnecessary, uh, but I will say things like that, that are meaningful to parents. Unfortunately, your child will never be able to walk again, will never be able to talk to you, will, will not recognize you when you come in a room. And, and, and that the things that they've lived for um, as a parent and have experienced, once they understand that they don't get, to, the future means not experiencing those things anymore, um, then they, they get a much better sense of what it means to stay alive on, on machines. Um, and so even though there might be some degree of recovery, it's not going to, at best case scenario, it's not going to be recovery to being able to talk or interact or do the things that they really hope for them. To piggyback on to what April said, the other thing too that's important is exploring hope. 
Um, because of course survival and her poor um, miracle and effects are just one of the many hopes that parents hold in the same space. So being able to let them process that and as able to like support that and validate that also allows them to open up to kind of get a little bit more detailed um, about what else they're hoping for. Because um, there's lots of hope everywhere in different situations. Um, just recently with a teenager whose um, condition continued to progress, um, the grandma was just hoping that this wasn't true. She was hoping that this is just a bad day, it's going to be fine, tomorrow's going to be better. And I said, I hope the same thing, but if that's not true, what else are you hoping for? And she said, mercy. I'm hoping for mercy. So what's mercy? Talk to me more about that. So there's room within the hope for survival and hope for a fix and this isn't right to also kind of tease out um, to be able to get at values that are important and like everybody said, an extremely tragic situation. Um, the other thing too is that, particularly for this case, um, the child's five and was previously healthy. I think that the parents' experience um, raising their child also has a lot to do with it. Neonates are particularly hard because they've never had the baby home. They really don't know, and with neonates, the spectrum of uncertainty even widens. Um, but a five-year-old, they knew what she was like before she got sick. She was supposed to start kindergarten. She was supposed to do all of that. So there is an idea of what they were and how they're going to be different, and also getting back to not necessarily what the parents want, but what would the child want. So tell me what Sally, if she were, you know, what would Sally say to us now? What do you think Sally would want us would want in this situation? Um, because no parent wants their child to die. So framing it more of what do you think Sally would be um, is also um, helpful in exploring values. So I think it's also really important as intensivists for us to know when there is true physiological uncertainty and when there's not, and to make that very clear. When well, there is true physiological uncertainty about the child's outcome, and about their chance of survival, and their neurological recovery, it's our job to recognize that. And if that's present, talk about a totally different situation. You know, that means there is some hope. And it's important for us to foster that hope and to support it. It's one of the reasons I couldn't be a neonatologist. When I was going through medical school, we didn't necessitate 24 week babies. We do now. The outcomes, there's a lot of good ones now. But right now, where we're at with neurointensive care, in a situation like this, we can say with certainty, this child's not going to recover. I hope, 20 years from now, I won't have so much certainty. I hope we'll have better therapies. I hope we will have something that will actually fix or help repair brain damage. But right now, we don't. And I can say that with certainty. It reminds me of uh, two cases that I've worked with over the last couple of years in a similar situation. Uh, both were at sort of this point as a result of an accident. And one father made the decision um, to stop life sustaining therapies for his son because he was aware that he could have his son on, on a ventilator and have a G tube and sit in his living And he was aware that if he did that, his words to me were, I would just be doing that for me. Because I want to keep being his dad, even if it's just him in my living And so, and he didn't feel, for him as a father, he didn't feel like that was a fair move for his son. He didn't feel like in that situation, he was being a good dad for his son. And then I think about another family, who said, as, as long as we can make a heartbeat show up, show up on the monitor, we should keep doing it. Because, again, from their social religious context, the most important thing to them was to be a parent to somebody in the room. And that's what they were going to keep doing as long as it was possible to them. And in the world of uncertainty, right, that all of those people get to hang out, they're all fair decisions. They are decisions that on both sides, both of those stories, I was uncomfortable with, it ended up. But it, they were decisions that these people could make. The other thing that I think about that kind of <coughs> sticks its finger in and keeps swirling the uncertainty around even more is like in this situation, so a person, a series of people weren't watching the five-year-old and she got into the pool. And so there's going to be some guilt and some responsibility for it. And that is going to, I think it's really going to influence decision. 
right? If this kid had gotten here as a result of like a crazy asthma exacerbation, then a family could say, well, it was a disease process, maybe there's something we could have done, but like this was a thing that was going to happen. But when when there's when there's agency in how a child got to this point, we see this with non-accidental trauma abuse situations, we see this with drunk driving situations where people feel responsibility, then they often end up pushing in a different way sometimes uh, than others might. And so that's another piece that helps to foment the uncertainty. So uh, I would like to invite our uh, audience to uh, respond, give feedback, um, and and all of us. This is a this is a very um, difficult kind of case to explore. So just to notice what comes up for all of us as we talk about it, as both clinicians as parents, um, it's it's a place where there's a lot at stake. And as we, as we explore this together, to, to really think about what might, uh, what might serve our conversation here today. So, we invite your comments or questions. Michelle has the <coughs> microphone. Who would like to be first? <coughs> Carol. I think it's always hard because of the uncertainty and neurologic problems. How does the process differ? As you just alluded to, you have a parent, and there's guilt because on your watch, either you know there was a drowning or anything. So you've got a parent who feels guilty, and they have their own process they have to go through. Versus, you know, you compare it to the neonatal situation where somebody is born with a child with a devastating disease. So you've got parent guilt, some either that maybe in denial versus another situation where the parent can be more detached. How does how does how do those two situations usually differ? I think there's guilt in both situations. Um, I think it's it becomes important to explore that guilt uh, with the family, uh, often with different uh, members of the multidisciplinary team, to understand what is going into that feeling of guilt. Um, and only once we understand it can we start to alleviate it and start to let families know that it's uh, whatever situation that we're in, we're going through it together. And often, Oftentimes, whatever factors are leading up to the devastating injury or the devastating condition, we are still in the same place that we are right now with the devastating uh, uh, neurological injury. So sometimes, while it's important to explore and then let those things go, we still have to go forward from the same place of a brain that's not going to recover or not going to be able to do the things that, that it's going to do. And I think once you've explored the guilt that goes into it, then families are much uh, better able to move forward from where we are. Also, in order to feel guilt, you have to have a strong, loving connection to that child. So guilt can be a very powerful emotion, and because the parent might be feeling guilty, it's their love for that child. It's hiring up that guilt and they have a lot of exploratory conversations about that and how much they do love their child and how much they want what's best for their child and take that love and redirect it from guilt into making the next step that is one of the most difficult decisions that they'll have to make their entire life but a decision that should be fed out of pure love and putting that love towards that and not towards the guilt. I, when you asked that question, I was thinking about like, the crazy compression of time on this. Because there are some cases that from the time they show up in our ICU until the time they're declared dead, it can be three days, maybe less than that. And I was just thinking about a, a recent case where a, a teenager had shown up to us as a result of a hanging, and the family was trying to understand it, felt some responsibility in it, but then two brain death 
exams later, was declared dead, and then they were gone. And then, and, you know, if it started on like a Saturday morning, we were, you know, you don't have as many social workers or chaplains around, like it just, all of this can happen, and everybody works so hard to respect the family as much as they can, but it, it ends up being this, because there is certainty in some situations, it just goes, and I just think about these four families that have, that went from the Labor Day barbecue to now before a full week has elapsed. They're at home without, without a child. It's, it's a crazy thing to try and conceptualize and really hard for as many good-hearted people as we can put in a room. It's really hard to be able to help support somebody through those decision-making. best steps forward is the sort of the fog of the trauma starts to clear and they can make better decisions and ask better questions. Can I just ask one more really quick question? Um, you also made a comment about uh, family belief system that you try to make decisions in, in accordance with the family school's belief system. In such situation, if, if there's a conflict between the family's belief system and some of the basic ground rules for medical ethics, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you approach that? Yeah, those are some very difficult cases. Uh, my personal approach is I never discredit anyone's belief system, and I'll always support it, even if it's a belief system that I. Personally, I cannot believe you were going along with, but I always support their belief system. I'll offer pray, I'll offer chant, I'll offer to do whatever it is that aligns with their belief system. Make sure they know we're all the same team here, and that we are all here for their child. And I say, hey, you're God, you're God's, your spirits, pray to them, do what you can do. I have my medicine, you have your belief. I'm never going to tell somebody not to believe what they believe. The reality is my medicine is what's keeping the child alive. And my medicine has its limits. Pray for your miracle. Do what you need to do to bring your miracle back. If it comes, I welcome it with open arms. These are the limits of my medicine right now. This is unfortunately what we're at. So one of the things that you've all sort of 
pointed to is the reality of that these situations produce a kind of moral residue. And even when we've done the right thing uh, in the conditions of uncertainty, there's also a kind of residue that goes along with it. Um, and I think part of that is because you know, as pediatric providers, we, we always want to benefit our, the patients and families in the best way that we can. Acknowledging the limits of our medical knowledge and skills. And at the same time, you know, a decision does have to be made. So there's always unmet ethical obligations in these circumstances. So how do you work with the moral residue yourself? process when it's difficult for families, I, I think it is at times our responsibility as, as providers and as caregivers to, to take some of that bonus and decision making on to ourselves, but that comes with a big burden um, because we, we go on with that, the consequences of those decisions and we carry those around with us and over time as we take care of our patients in these difficult situations be carrying more and more and more. Um, and I personally feel like there are there are several cases that I can name, several patients who stay with me and who I think about and, and I think about the decisions that were made in their difficult circumstances. Um, and, and that can become very burdensome, um, but I, I try to use that the next time that I'm in these difficult situations and say, what what went right, what felt good, um, what am I proud of in terms of that interaction, and, and what didn't feel good, and how can I do it differently the next time, so that it becomes less of a burden and becomes more of, of an experience and a learning experience and something that I can take with me to, to hopefully help other families who are suffering with um, some of the most devastating things that they could I, I'm just going to steal your answer. I, I, uh, yeah, it's got to be a transform, transformation of that moral residue. Is that your term? Moral residue? I mean, there are some of us that if we were to get rid of all of our moral residue, there wouldn't be much left. Right? If we could wash it off. Because it's just so prevalent here. But the idea of being able to take it and transform it, of how did I do my best in this situation, what did I learn, how, did, how can I apply that in the next situation? With the commitment, every time I'm going to do my best here, and it, it may end up being really heavy at the end of the day. Uh, and then we've all, everybody got their own spectrum of things that they do to kind of uh, have their own survival techniques of what you need to do to be a whole human and a whole professional and come back and do it again. But, but being able to, to try and, and, and transform that and not lose it and not be overwhelmed by it, and not be overburdened by it, but, but be able to use it for the better of the next patient and family, I think is the best one that I, I can be. I'll just go with that. I have a very different answer, um, but working on your own personal resiliency, um, I also use this more residue to inspire you to do better next time recognize when my team really does a good job and pat them on the back for how far they've come. Recognize when we've fallen short and use that for motivation to not fall on that same hole again. I think it's important to name it for what it is. I think especially in the ICU, these cases are difficult for everybody. The bedside nurse, the therapist, the pets, the social workers, the multidisciplinary subspecialists. And to recognize that and look your team in the eye and say this is hard and as you're sorry, but it's the right thing to do. And to pat them on the back and give them hugs and name it for what it is and have your moment of grief, but also knowing that you're doing the right thing and supporting each other through that and taking the time to recognize it for what it is. And one thing that um, I've always appreciated about Hopkins here, I don't know if many of you know, but in the picky when a child passes away, you do something called the honor guard. Um, and so for children who live for up to a year or more in the ICU if they pass away, um, 
after uh, they've been cleaned up and they're on their way down to the ward behind the back hallway with all the ICU workers and we silently give our honor to them. We get this for every patient passes through the union and it gives us a physical time to release and to give honor and to reflect on our work with that child. And I think that that's, you know, one of many things that we can do to recognize the difficulty of these situations. I just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> just um, So kind of similarly, um, as everyone else has said, is I think just valid validating that it exists. Um, sometimes people, when we talk about suffering or moral distress, it's just really easy to say, hey, you know, that's a you issue or that's just you, but really and truly just respecting the difficulty that um, we all experience in these situations is part of it. And I think another part for me is just learning over time and understanding the me component in a lot of it is it's not necessarily the outcome that I really struggle with, but it's more the decision-making process that went into it. Um, we put a lot of pressure on families um, the decisions that they make, that we ask them to make, um, are life and death. The stakes are so high, and it's a lonely, scary journey to be able to have to do that all by yourself. And so being able to support them and helping them make sure that we are giving them the information they need to make this decision. Because so many times the decision we're asking them to make, um, if you don't have the right information to make it, it's really not fair to put that burden on the family. So how can we do a better job at communicating um, and giving the parents information in ways that make sense and are important to them um, is kind of something that I strive to do. And I think it helps me because with each case, um, you, you tailor it, you learn, you grow. Um, and so you can always do better um, for the next child. And then the other thing is, if you look at the moral distress um, literature, then you can um, probably speak better to this than um, I. But um, trust and mutual respect is what underlines all of it. Um, cases and patients are a piece of it and are kind of the face, but really and truly um, what keeps the residue there. Um, trust and relationships and team dynamics are a big part of that. Um, so trying to know and understand what I can do um, to support our team and um, help us trust each other is also important in each of the cases. Um, as someone has said it many times, is we are all here to do a good job. There is so much emotion um, that goes into it. And so how we can trust each other and treat each other well in a hard situation is only going to trickle down um, to the patients and the families. And, and to, to think back on that, um, you know, we are not, not only do we have many different providers working and taking care of these patients, but we have learners at many different levels who are, who are experiencing this and with, with different degrees of experience with these difficult situations. And so um, it's important not just to recognize it, but often with my junior residents or with the medical students who are coming in and sometimes seeing this devastating situations for the first time, I do like to sit down, I like to talk, I like to recognize all of the things that I'm experiencing and thus normal, normalizing their emotional experience. Um, and I think just having that conversation all together where we're all it, having a similar experience also diffuses that sort of moral residue and we all share it and, and this don't take as, as much home with us on that in terms of the work. I, I in a sense we're two young kids. Um, one, one as a rabbi and then as a medical chaplain. Um, unfortunately, the frustration that I, um, I I'm confronted sometimes with very religious families. They feel that God is testing them. And um, how they treat this child, which is God's child, they have to do everything to make sure to it that this child has the best care, no matter what the situation is with this God child. So I have to come sometimes as the rabbi or something to say to them, and, and, you know, I mean, denial is a big thing, you all know. And I stand up for all of you, by the way. I mean, it's unbelievable what these what these people do, but um, denial is is a big thing. But the thing is that so I have to come and I have to say, you know, you hear the doctors are saying the child is no hope. 
there is no hope for the child. Um, but yet, sometimes, in, and then they say, my child died from nothing. You know, that no reason at all. I said, no. You got maybe is there because your child now will warn parents and people, you gotta be more careful by a swimming pool. You can't let children swim alone. Um, we had a, I was involved in a case very recently about a child that died because the father left the, the baby in the car. Well, the mother, the mother of the baby in the car and he and the baby died. Um, and so about divorce and the whole marriage is coming apart because of that because of the situation. But there's also, you know, I, the case of the, the child died from nothing. But it's a, it's a lesson. It's a lesson that you've got to be more cautious. You know, and, and this is what God is, is using it. The child that I did not die in vain. There are lessons to be learned from this as well. So sometimes it can bring a little comfort to the parent from, from a religious perspective. That God does not always want you just to sit there and go on with the child forever. You know, you have to accept the fact. And there's a lesson to be learned. I want to just, before we close, um, it is not the case that all clinicians agree about uh, limitations of treatment uh, in these circumstances. And I just want to, as we close up, to, to acknowledge that and also to think about, you know, it, it is not the case that there's only one answer in these, in these particular circumstances. And so, when there are differences of opinion, um, how do we navigate those? Yeah, Ignore my, those two. Yeah, my <laughs> <business>. <laughs> uh, I, you guys go. This is my closing point of my direction. <laughs> um, ideally, uh, those conversations are being had behind. 12 different closed doors and hopefully very far away from families um, and ideally far from the frontline providers, um, you need the vet centers and the vet CRTs and people are actually physically touching the patient. I can't imagine that for a vet center nurse, for a parent, knowing that your physician and your providers are on a different page about <coughs> care plan, especially with a care plan, potentially um, involves uh, the death of a child. Um, but Cinda is uh, absolutely correct. Um, even within the PICU, there are, um, uh, we are often divided. Um, the question is, is, you know, is it a case where we're dealing with physiologic uncertainty? And if there is true physiologic uncertainty, there's probably 20 different opinions at the table and figuring out the direction to go in those situations is astronomically difficult. Um, even trying to, at least have the majority of us, hopefully um, agree to a plan of care and stick to it as I do. Um, I think, fortunately though, when you're talking brain death or when you're talking so neurologically devastated that a child's gonna live in a comatose state, um, I believe that all of the intensives in my group feel the same way but at the same time, feel the same way about the physiological outcome, about the child's outcome, but at the same time, um, some people are a little less comfortable with that, a little less comfortable knowing that how they guide this family and the decisions that they make over the next two weeks is either gonna end in the child's death or a child still being alive. And I think that many intensivists are more or less comfortable with knowing that they're going to sign that child's death certificate rather than having somebody else do it. Um, but again, I just, when there's a difference of opinions, hopefully it is so far from the bedside that it never gets there. Um, and hopefully we can respectively have our decisions. I, I think that last point is, is one of the most important. We, we have to approach it with respect for our colleagues and for everyone who is caring for the child and, and really caring for the family and recognize that everyone is trying to do what is best for them, um, even if they approach it in a different way or their comfort level is uh, uh, varies, that we're all really working together as a team. Um, and so not letting things come down to uh, conflict or 
to personal um, biases uh, against each other, but really working together to, to just understand where everyone is coming from, and that's the only way to go towards a, a real solution. So I want to thank our panel um, for the insights that you brought and also the wisdom that you shared with our community. Um, this is the, one of the most difficult kinds of cases that I think um, many clinicians um, confront, and there are no easy answers. And so our process for how we approach these issues matters as much as the outcome of them. And so I think what we've heard today is the importance of um, you know, really creating a, a moral community where we can raise the issues uh, to identify where we have differences of viewpoints, how we actually honor the child, the family, and our teams uh, in this process. So join me in thanking our panel.